Hi, my name is Dr. Brian Curtis with Fossil Crates, and I'm here to talk about Apocalypse Now. Yes, it dropped the best paper to date on the argument for lips and theropods. So let's jump right in. Well, this paper looks into two distinct approaches for demonstrating that theropods likely do have lips. So the first approach they took was they looked at the enamel and all teeth have enamel and they took one theropod tooth, a dyspletosaurus tooth, and they, they used histology, they ground it up, they did some really cool things to it, and they noticed that the, the enamel on the, the lip side and the tongue side is about the same distance. And this isn't a tooth of an adult, it's been in there a year or more, and so they know this tooth's been around a while, and yet the enamel is worn equally on each side. And then they contrast that with an alligator tooth that they ground down. And this alligator tooth showed that the enamel on the side where their lips would be if they had them uh, was much thinner and much less reduced, much more reduced versus the side on the inside. The fact that the tooth's enamel was narrower on the side that faces outward suggests to them that these teeth are being abused and beat up because they don't have lips. Now, enamel really likes water to, to maintain its strength and if a tooth is gonna last a year or more in the mouth, well, it probably needs some water on both sides to keep it that nicely balanced. So it's a really strong argument for why it has lips. In order for a tooth to stay in the mouth for as long as they apparently do in Tyrannosaurus, which is 777 days, uh, that's a long time to have a functional tooth before the replacement comes in. So if they're truly lasting that long, you wanna take care of them. And lips definitely would do that. I went down a rabbit hole here and went in another paper, and this paper talks about tooth replacement in dinosaurs. And that's where the 777 days comes from. But they looked at Majungasaurus, and it's only 56 days before it gets a brand new tooth. That's not even two months old. Not even enough time to get cavities. So if you don't have lips, who cares? And Allosaurus was 104 days, Ceratosaurus was 107 days. And so it makes me wonder if maybe some theropods did have lips and others did not, because if you're losing teeth that fast, do you need any kind of protection on them? So we talked about enamel and how the enamel is a really strong indicator. They also pivoted and looked at regression analysis of skull, total skull length to total tooth height above the jaw. Now, why would they do this? One of the big arguments we talked about is the teeth are too big for lips. Well, one way to look at it is, let's look at other animals the varanid lizards that have this ziphodont dentition, and let's see how they compare to theropods in terms of the size. And what you may not know, because you never see the li lizard's teeth, is these have some pretty sizable chompers. Uh, Varana salvadorii has teeth that are actually, in proportion to the length of the skull, larger than that of the theropods even. So we know that it has lips. All the lizards today have lips. And the they measured these two measurements, the length and to the tooth height, and they plotted it in a scatter plot. And they uh, converted them into log and used regression. So they use a bunch of cool tools that all of you that are going to become scientists are going to have to learn at some point because it's a way of taking data and allowing us to talk about orders of magnitude of size difference in an intelligent fashion. And they did all the right things. I really like this paper's approach. They give you all the raw data so you can replicate it yourself. And the punchline is they put up a graph and the graphs run parallel to one another and very close. There's a few outliers, there always are, but in this case, the, the taxa that have the length to the total height match. And what this conclusion is, is if it's good enough for, for varanids, it's certainly good enough for theropod dinosaurs. If all of the animals that plot on this graph ha of the varanids have lips, and we know they do, we can see them, then the argument that the teeth were too big falls flat because these giant sized teeth are fully enshrouded in lips today. So if you take the evidence of wear, of enamel wear, and you mix it with the evidence of the fact that morphologically speaking, using those coordinates, the dinosaurs fall within the same line, that's two very different and yet compelling reasons to think that theropods had lips. So I came into this, really a no lip guy, but I'm, I'm starting to think that lips are on the menu. Now, here's what I'd like to see for some graduate student, some work somewhere to continue. 
Let's plot other beasts. Ceratosaurus isn't in their list. Now it's because there's no complete skull, but we do have a pretty good skull reconstruction now. It'd be neat to compare their total length to the height and see where it falls on the line. What do Varanids enamel look like? If we took a Varanid tooth, is it equal on either side? Are lots of other vertebrates? Let's also measure other beasts. Let's measure Simosuchus, the little short-nosed uh, crocodile. Let's just see where other animals fall on the chart. Another line of evidence that they used to suggest that lips were present was the presence of foramina. So if you look at this diagram, you'll see that you have these holes along the top of the maxilla above the teeth. And that's an interesting thing to note. We see it in lizards and we see it in theropods. When you look at, at the crocodiles and alligators, they have holes all over the skull. It's not just in this nice little line. Now, one thing that did give me some pause is when you look at lizards, they have those holes and that's it. They are smooth. And not all lizard skulls that I've looked at have the foramen at all. Maybe it's a size item, maybe it's ontogenetic, I don't know. But I do know that it's not present everywhere. This is not a 100% canonical fact from what my eyes have told me thus far. And when I look at some theropods, uh, they have holes above as well. So the holes on the alligator are sensory oriented. They have a bunch of nerve endings that go up there and help it sense things in the water. Possibly theropods have some kind of sensory thing going on as well, which would account for a number of those foramina. But definitely the theropod maxillae are not smooth like the lizards. Uh, another thing of note is the teeth of theropods and lizards are straight, they're parallel. I mean, they curve to get up front, but they're in a line. Whereas when you look at crocodile and alligator teeth, they may be parallel on the back, but they start to curve outward. Now that is an interesting fact, but it also made me wonder, could that enamel wear differentiation be because the crocodiles are biting or using their teeth in a different manner than theropods and lizards? I'll leave you all with some pictures I've taken over the years of various lizard teeth. Uh, it's been a hobby of mine. <laughs> who knew, uh, to take photos. And when I was in the Galapagos, I really spent a lot of time trying to photograph teeth. And I got some shots of them, but I'll tell you, it was tough. I took thousands of pictures to get these handful of photos. And I'm sure the Komodo dragons are similarly difficult. And when they open their mouth, you just don't see the teeth popping. The teeth are fully ensconced in tissue. And then you have this beautiful scales that cover it and protect it from the outside. So to sum it all up, they used enamel thickness and the disparity between crocs and theropods, though they didn't do lizards. They used regression analysis to show that the size of the teeth of the lizards are equal or greater than, in some cases, proportionate to the theropod teeth, and all the lizards have scales. So big teeth does not preclude scales. And they use the presence of foramina in this line to suggest that these foramina are driving the lips. I really like how they suggest that lips is the primitive condition, that we should expect everything to have lips, and when something doesn't have lips, it's anomalous. I liken this to the aquatic pursuit predator Spinosaurus. Was he or wasn't he? And is it Nanotyrannus or no Tyrannus? You've also had Taurosaurus and Triceratops. Does Pachycephalosaurus batter rams or flank thump or something else? You need people of, of, of opposing opinions to help drive science forward because they'll come up with ideas, they'll test each other. And I got my popcorn ready. I'm just sitting here watching. I'm really enjoying this. But I think that this paper is a super solid entry. And I'm sure that the uh, non-lip people will be sharpening their pencils and getting their publications out hopefully soon. And I can't wait because what this shows is there's so much left to be done, so much work to be done, so much knowledge to be learned. And I'm hoping someone watching this can jump into the fray and take it to the next level. I'm Dr. Brian Curtis with Fossil Grade saying thank you kindly. Adios.